And uh, obviously, I've, uh, I'm not going to follow the script, but um, I think the slides that uh, we've got here now, um, I think what, these are the key areas um, of, our, of the vision which is uh, set out in this, uh, our plan for the environment. And the first element is embracing environmental innovation ambition. That ties in with what we plan to do on following through climate change and so on sustainable transport and, and in other areas. Secondly, the key issue of protection, protecting the natural environment through the whole raft of conservation measures, protection, sustainable resource use and demand management. And so these are very high level objectives. Below that, there are a lot of action plans in place. And of course, up there and, on, and follow that, the other part of the equation, urban areas and uh, are built areas, placemaking, improving the built environment, to retain the sense of Jersey's place as a special place, its culture and its distinctive local identity. Those are key objectives. Now, uh, the headline we've had, it's a four year plan, but we had to focus in on what can be done in year one. And the first thing, of course, is the major projects that we've already started, which really uh, is a lot of work going on on the draft island plan which we have to bring to the States Board for debate in 2021. And next year, there'll be a draft plan and, and, and uh, your opportunity, many of opportunities to engage with it, as it is already. And of course, that's a key one. And then, of course, the issue of climate emergency. In parallel with this, of course, we're charged, this council of ministers charged to bring a plan to the States in the same time span as this will be debated. With an, and of course the plan has to make provision, how are we going to do that? And a funding allocation of re, from central reserves of £5 million pounds and a flow of money through the four years, I forget the amount of money, but it's quite a number of million pounds with, from fuel duty, which will allow, uh, which will ring fence that money into going into climate uh, uh, emergency, emergency measures and removing uh, carbon. And then obviously the key questions as well, is in managing our environment, dealing with issues of waste and water pollution, particularly uh, water pollution, air pollution, whole raft of pollutions and so on, where interventions are necessary, we need to upgrade. And then, of course, another area which my, de which my assistant minister, Deputy Gregory Gieder, is leading on strongly, on biodiversity. Biodiversity, the whole issue of trees, biodiversity, species, uh, and, and so on, there's a whole raft of actions there and there is very significant money in the plan which is really good news and an area which has been neglected for many many years uh, how we manage our open land assets our special places into uh, countryside access there's a line of money there of several hundred thousand pounds to in fact help islanders be able to enjoy and actively uh, enjoy our special places our, our countryside so I think that's, uh, that includes uh, mine. I think now I'll hand over to Kevin because Kevin and I are obviously so many of our, um, our objectives in the plan overlap. We work together uh, and obviously um, it's, so therefore I'm going to hear from Kevin about his particular initiatives. Thank you very much. I should know the figure. It's a lot of money. Good evening. Thank you, John. Um, I've only got one slide, okay. but uh, this slide belies uh, a great deal of change. Uh, the State's Assembly has declared a climate emergency, and officers are now preparing a strategy to achieve the aim of being, being carbon neutral by 2030. That's just 11 years away. 11 years in which to end our reliance on the internal combustion engine. Now you may have seen, been on the new electric bus, it's a, a great favourite of mine, um, and you may have been one of the 400 who applied for the government subsidy to buy an electric bike which we launched recently. These are small steps, but much bigger steps will set out a sustainable transport plan which I will take to the States later this year. This will help us make measurable progress towards our goals of 2020. As we encourage people out of their cars, we are going to improve the urban environment with bus routes, cycle paths, and walkways that better serve the users. We're investing in our sea defenses and the infrastructure 
for managing our liquid, solid, and green waste. And work is continuing on the largest, on our largest project, the new sewage treatment works, which incidentally you're all invited to see on our open day next Saturday. These are plans for the next 12 months, and they are the foundation of work that will continue over the next four years. I'm now going to hand you back to the Chief Minister, who is going to talk about the funding for these priorities and uh, then facilitate questions from the board. Thank you. Right, uh, thanks, uh, John and Kevin. Um, what, they've obviously talked through the, the key initiatives and activities in their areas, but again, how are we funding it? So over the period of the government plan, I think it's an additional 15 million on, on the environment, and that includes 2 million on innovation and ambition, 400,000 on protecting the natural environment, 700,000 pounds on the improving the built environment. And in addition, we're investing a further 116 million pounds in infrastructure associated with this policy. As we've talked about earlier, we're setting up a new climate emergency fund, and in 2020, that's going to be used to fund activities worth about two and a half million, including the sustainable transport plan, uh, enhancing environmental protection systems, and policy development. So, as we sort of move to, um, to, to, to wrapping up, uh, almost on time, so we've, cut, I've, we've covered quite a lot of ground, uh, A in the plan, but E the B tonight. So, but we've taken decisions to deal with the legacy issues we've inherited, and there are quite a few. We've taken decisions to deal with some of the long-term problems on the horizon, and there are also one or two there. And we've done so whilst putting only limited extra demand at this stage on the taxpayer. We are intending to go further on expenditure and savings. But do remember, uh, we are below the budget that was actually uh, approved uh, in last year. We're putting money aside for any harder times ahead. We're putting money aside for children, mental health, housing, culture, the economy, and the climate emergency. It also provides greater flexibility to protect us against any potential bumps on the road. We've also balanced the books. So it is a government plan that we believe is responsible, we believe is sustainable, and it is focused on the longer term. Obviously, it's going to be debated formally in the State's Assembly in November. Aim of tonight and similar, year, and the similar sessions is to hear views and questions now. Uh, obviously, we are taking one or two questions from social media, so we're going to try and answer those questions during the session. And if I can just remind uh, people here, the comment I made at the very beginning, that it is on Facebook Live, so if you don't want your details, you're not going to be filmed, it's, it's pointing our direction. But if you don't want your details, then don't give your name. Uh, so on that note, it's over to you. Anybody want to um, go for the first question? Of course, the individual I've never seen before in my life. <laughs> and uh, we'll go from there. Richard Lacane. Does your budget fully fund the proposed shoreline protection plan? I think that's all for Kev. Shoreline protection plan. Would you like to expand a bit on that? The, the thing that was presented earlier this year, the study of what would happen to our shoreline as a result of rising sea levels. 100 million. Um, not at the moment, no. That's, still, that's sort of policy and development, but uh, it's, it's, it is happening. We're obviously very confident of that. But the new sewerage plant was obviously going to go a long, long way to protecting our environment. And obviously we have the runoff from the land which runs into Snowden's Bay which uh, has been problematic for a while, um, not from the sewage plant, I, I admit, uh, but um, there's a lot of work going there. We do have a climate emergency has been announced. We do have uh, rising tides, but that is happening. I wouldn't say um, that's a 10 years off. I think it's here now. Um, fires are still burning in the Amazon and, and in Africa, and it, it's, I say this is ongoing. We are keeping a, a watching brief on this. It's uh, we've been down to Beaumont where we raised the height of the sea wall down there and uh, put deflectors in to deflect the tide back out again. That's all working well. But uh, we will need to raise the height of some of the sea walls uh, coming up on the south coast. But if there's anything specific, you know, if I'm far from that. Well, no, what you're saying is that the next four years are not budgeting any significant expenditure in relation to rising sea levels. 
Well, so we've got the coastal protection budget in, yes. But um, let's say this, this is a quite a wide subject for us. I think actually it, it's it terminology crosses, here. Um, it crosses yeah. a, a, both John and myself. So actually, I was just going to, um, I don't know if. I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah, to that. I was just looking at John's uh, head of the, is the chief officer, uh, director general. Uh, I didn't get business card names. Yeah. 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 Um, the, the, the money for the, 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 the first phase of this is study and understanding uh, climate change and the, the rising sea levels is, a, is going to be a big problem for us. And, but it's not a problem for the next four years. And this plan looks at four years. So the next yeah. 10 years, 10 beyond that, it's going to be a massive investment that brings us to the island. And we've got to get. So we're going to start saving. We've got to start saving for it, yes, that's absolutely right. But for this four-year plan, the money's in to do the proper studies and the hydrographic in, uh, work that we need to do. So I suppose, actually, you know, one, one other thing to say on this, um, it's a rolling four-year plan. So we're doing this next year, so the main expenditure is about 2020. It looks at projections going forward. It will have to come back to the stage each year, and each year we will add on a projection for the following four years out. So at the end of the four years that we're talking about, uh, depending on the outcome of the studies, you will probably then see the funding demands that are coming through. But the idea is that, uh, bluntly, we don't get caught, when I say caught out, um, when, I stood for when we stood for election last time round, so in May of last year, I was not aware that we had a 30 million pound deficit for the projected at the end of the expenditure plans, i.e. notionally on the 1st of January of next year. Um, that should not be possible next time around because we'll be building those projections through and you will at the very least be able to see what the bad news is coming forward in normal circumstances and then how you can plan for it. So that's again a bit of, of the pun, a bit of a sea change in, in where we're going. reputational issues and obviously and so I think that is an issue that's come up in discussion obviously we are the way I see it the, the states will receive a report setting out a strategy which will be a very high level plan and that will have to go to, uh, first of all to the council of ministers and then to states and then I think there's a big issue of public consultation because I'm quite clear that this climate change is so significant so significant that it needs a whole community response to it because the actions are so potentially so substantial. That issue will feature, I think, in the discussions and somehow I've already got to find you know, where to draw those policies. So I think you're right to flag it up, but you know, we are, we are on the start of a journey and I think so, I, I think that's an issue that I know that uh, it's risen in the concept of our, our trying to build our reputation internationally, where it's already very, very high in international aid as well. And I think that issue has come out strongly. So I think, uh, I think keep the dialogue up and uh, involve yourself in the, in, the, in the community responses. That's what I'd say yeah. at the moment. I, think so. I mean, the, the, 
there are, there are some, you're getting some tensions in all that area, because obviously we look at financial services, you know, genuinely we uh, pride ourselves on our overall reputation, that's about statutory legal responsibilities um, and all that type of thing. We, you know, we've got some of the best regulated entities on the planet. Um, but um, if it's then in terms of what the states do in terms of the, uh, the shares we hold and where they're invested, again, I haven't looked at that for a while, but um, I can certainly go back and find out what the situation is. It has been raised in the past, I do know that, about ethical investment. But I think that's uh, it's probably changed since the last time, uh, last time it was raised. We've also got to also bear in mind that, yes, environmental impact versus uh, financial and economic impact on the island and, and which way it goes. That's the tension. And we've got to make sure, you know, we are very clear, we've got to support the economy as well as manage the, uh, the environment side. Um, that's not at all costs, by the way. Um, what John's referring to is one of the estate's decisions was as part of the climate emergency side of things. It is brought to council ministers at every meeting so far, mainly because they're on quite a tight time frame to produce the high level plan that we're talking about. And actually in terms of uh, carbon neutrality and how you aim to achieve that, um, there are two or three levels as to what generates that carbon. And one of those is about um, other activities that this island benefits from, but not actually necessarily taking place uh, on the island. And that could be at the one end of the extreme, uh, are there activities and companies based here, or are there multinational issues? Or for example, if you buy an electric car, what's the carbon footprint of that elsewhere in terms of its manufacturer, and how you take that into account? What about your mobile phone, you know? Um, what's it used, where's it made, and, MR, you know, and the carbon miles attached to it? That is a wider discussion. We are thinking about it, but um, as John's saying, it's very much at a high level at this stage. Uh, my question's in two parts, but it touches on what you just said. Yeah. You say carbon neutral. Uh, have we got a definition of that yet? Is it is it just what we produce on the island, or do we take into account, you know, the, the ship bringing goods mm -hmm. here, the lorries that have brought it to the harbour, etc. Um, and and secondly, uh, and it, it could well be. shipped in, that's all used um, marine diesel and such like um, aviation is quite big but um, all the carbon is put together, even the carbon that is produced if you like, from the electricity to France, from the nuclear power even a percentage of that is taken on board with its manufacture The reason I was grinning is yeah. because you I mean, were probably eavesdropping, eavesdropping out discussions earlier today which is John is saying a work, and there's a lot of, I think there's some material published in recent reports, which gives you the numbers. I mean, in terms of our own carbon um, carbon emissions, um, some the, the last figures I saw was about 47% uh, of our di own direct carbon emissions are vehicle related. And I think around about 25, 28%, I think, is domestic and business heating premises. So now that in terms of direct elimination of our own emissions, then th those are key targets. I think we. I think at the moment there's about three or four percent carbon emissions on it on the electricity because uh, the any emissions that are, are from the, ca the the electricity that comes down the cable are accounted for in France. At the moment, the system is is that we have external audited accounting now internationally <laughs> under international standards of that. So those figures are there. But obviously, in the future, I mean, there's no question this issue is actually about the uh, carbon uh, as a result of, uh, if you like, embedded activities of us uh, transport, particularly transport in and out of the island. We did have a discussion today about council uh, about this. I think within, at the moment, the emerging strategy, and this will have to go to consultation in the States, is that we're talking about net zero, net zero carbon as being rather than uh, total carbon, which brings with it, if that's the case, that will bring with it the issue of um, sequestration and so on, sequestration payments. That is an issue which I think will have to be um, you know, considered. There's no firm decisions that have been made on that. Um, but I think because you know, my personal view, 
is, I mean, the, the island has a, has a you know, are we, are we potentially looking at eliminating all air travel or sea travel in and out of the island? I'd be very surprised. Uh, and so, therefore, I think those issues are there on the table for us. And I've forgotten the terminology because what that discussion was at the beginning of what's been quite a long day today. Um, is it scope one and scope two, isn't it? Is oh, yes, I'm, I'm so not a great right. expert yeah. on this. Fortunately, we, have, we have got some experts. I don't know if they're here in the room or that. Uh, who are, uh, so, so an excellent team are working on this. And the good news is that they are working well with Guernsey as well. Guernsey, I think, recognise that this is an area where we've fortunate. We've got good expertise in our officers. And, uh, and you know, there, there's, there is an international jargon about how you can move out of this going. You know, scope one, scope two, all these different terminology, it's got its own uh, language. And so I think, you know, early days yet, we'll be publishing, uh, you know, say we committed to bring in a report of a draft strategy for the state by the end of the year, but there are work to do in terms of public consultation and engagement, which is, you can expect, what's this space? But in the meantime, we've had to put the money in the government plan because unless there was money to do, to even start to do, some of these things forward, you know, we <coughs> have a potential problem. So I'm very pleased we've got that fund. We'll go there now, just to, uh, for the, in, in terms of... Uh, just on the energy board, I mean, obviously uh, you may be reassured the uh, work that's been done. It's the best of the national standards, and uh, there's a lot of uh, calculations that need to be done in all the things. I think it's important for the board to be in the region alone with the uh, island. Just to finish, I'll go to uh, that. Um, the estimate, I think, from officers today was that carbon funds for scope one and two, and I'm not going to try and define scope one and two, was in the order of 350, 360,000, if I remember correctly. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. right, yeah. Okay. Yes, I need to be on our I'm trying not to name you, so that. Absolutely. No, the carbon sequestration is something that, that uh, interests me. Uh, I believe that the last figures put out were 3.5 tonnes of carbon per head on the island. Um, out of the 5 million, how much is going to be potentially available to the private sector and innovations there? Uh, there was a three month uh, trial that's now been completed with food waste and uh, composting that into a point where that can go into carbon sequestration. Um, we're currently burning 14,000 tonnes a year of food waste at the energy waste plant. According to the JEC, that is the largest contributor to their carbon footprint of the electricity. Okay. They're very easy, although they're distributed. Um, there is, the process is there, ready and available in the island. It needs kickstart funding. Is the government going to be able to provide that? Okay, I'll hand over to these guys in a minute. Thank you. I'm guessing, John, but hang on a the, the, sh um, the short, relatively short answer at the moment is that the five million was purely a sum of money to, to, to set up a fund in recognition you're going to need some cash to start some of the work. Um, I don't even know if you've identified full terms of reference on the fund. Oh, yeah, don't know. The yeah. terms of reference are actually in Absolutely. the proposition, sorry. Yeah. And I don't, off the top of my head, uh, recall that it's got private sector or not, but John can be telling us. If not, we can always amend those going forward. Um, it was very much to put some money, to get some money, pot of money, in place to start addressing things. Uh, it is obviously topped up with then the extra amount on the fuel duty going forward. So it's not just five million. I think you've identified the amount going forward, um, going up to about 11 or so. Um, uh, but I suspect actually that as these things then come to fruition, you're then going to have to have, over the time we're looking at, other ways of, um, of, of funding this. So the point is that we could, yeah. we could be doing on Ireland a creditable carbon sequestration within the next six to yeah. nine months. I'll hand it to John. I think, uh, as the uh, Chief Minister said, 
Um, obviously, in parallel with the big, big book for four years we published, you've also had to publish the actual proposition, and this deals with the actions where the state's assembly is required to make binding decisions on the 2020 allocations, and included in that is a, um, a statement that the states established a climate emergency fund in accordance with the law and Appendix 3 and so on. It's all here, the terms of reference in there. And so the fund won't actually exist until the states actually approve it. But furthermore, what, what, this, what we've gone further is that then there's a second part of that proposition that says, here's by the, and also put this money into the fund and improve the allocations. And so the, the purpose is at the moment, and what it says is to support initiatives, it says, to support initiatives that respond to the climate emergency and the initiatives that reduce carbon emissions and other pollutions in line with etc. So it's all there. Obviously, this is, gone, uh, this is out for the public now. Uh, scrutiny are looking at it. Obviously, it, it, these things, personally, I think, I mean, this is, a, this is an initial go at it. I think it's pretty good. Uh, certainly, I must admit, I didn't have it in any fixed views in my own mind, but the main thing is it's got to be related to, uh, to achieving our climate change targets. And of course, that, but I would imagine that the rules for that will have to, that each scheme that comes along will have to go through some form of assessment, how effective and how good use of uh, funding it is. But there we are, we've got the machinery, states approve this, I think it's a really big step, and it's ring fenced. So that means those monies won't get disappeared off for anything else. Yep. What worries me is that the money's going to get used on doing studies and drawing up procedures and protocols. Mm -hmm. Private sector could be up and running tomorrow. Well, obviously, there's a room for debate about, about that. I can see it can be a lot of interest in this fund. But I mean, what we've set down under summary table six is a list of things uh, which include particularly known strength of environmental protection, sustainable transfers policy development, as has been said, and also uh, environmental management and so on. They're listed in there, but I don't think those are sufficiently defined as yet. Uh, they are by the way of provisions, budgetary provisions, from which decisions will be made at, at a later date. So uh, if, you've got, if people have got ideas, um, well, this is, you know, we're in an open public process here. Put them forward. Okay, yeah, that's back. back. Um, Okay, um, I, I, I want to look at the big picture. So yep. I'm going to ask you a question that relates to everything that you've, you've shown us, but in particular to the environment. Uh, I, I really would like to know, and I'd like to figure, um, what is the government policy moving forward through this period you're talking about uh, for economic growth? And as I say, I'd like to figure. There is concern out here. You, you as the government might have a policy, but we understand that Charlie Parker, uh, if you look at what's happened in previous jurisdictions, has in his mind a policy for economic growth. The problem with that is if there's a strong policy for economic growth, it's about increasing the population, and increasing population is going to affect the environment in particular, and it will touch everything that you're talking about. So could we have a, a, a decision on if you've got a fixed policy, and what the figure is that we will try to obtain. Right, in terms of the additional revenue expenditure for 2020, well actually, for the period of the plan, I do know the figure, but I'm just going to double check before I start reading it out. Uh, under economy, and it is split into various sections, um, it is around 80 million over the, that four year period. Okay, that's what you asked for. So I'm asking you for a figure for economic growth, so what, you, what's, what percentage oh, hang on, of sorry. growth? Right, so, that, growth. so that's in terms of the impact of what we spend and then the, the forecast of what that will generate. Yes, exactly. Uh, I don't have that data right, to hand yeah. tonight, well, but I'll I'm, see if we can get something to you. The point I'm asking is, if you're pushing for economic growth of you know, 2% or 5%, whatever, that would also push the population. And I know Chris Toner and his team are working yeah. on a population policy, but if somebody else is pushing for economic growth, you're fighting each other. Uh, actually, it's a bit worrying, actually, if people have been listening to our conversation today. It's quite, it's quite <laughs> opportune. Um, so, essentially, there are actually five, we were talking about four of them, uh, what we call policy development boards, which are kind of a concept I've introduced, um, building on, 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 on um, things that have been done in the past. As you know, there's one about mi uh, migration policy, which Chris yeah. Turner is chairing. Yeah. Um, there's one uh, on housing, which is about trying to do affordable housing. Yeah. There's one um, 
uh, on econo uh, economic growth, basically, and there's one about um, uh, future revenue. Mm -hmm. And so the fit, I was going to say, the other strand is actually more importantly about the island plan. Yeah. And it's about perhaps so that's not so much positive on borders yet. That's just general the process. Mm -hmm. And so the discussion actually we said is some of the pieces of work we set going early because population is co very complicated. It may not, sometimes you're just thinking, well, let's just shut the doors, but you can't do that because there are consequences to that. Other people want to leave the doors wide open, but you can't realistically do that either mm -hmm. for exactly <laughs> the reason you put it in place. So, um, and so you've then just got to understand what the various consequences are doing, and that's why actually population on the work on it is why we set some piece of work going on that August, September last year. Yeah. Now, in terms of do we have a number in mind, not yet. We have discussed that a little bit at Council Minister today. Population or growth? Population. Right. Um, now, and so we have discussed, and therefore the idea is that over the next few months there are going to be some more discussions just starting to bring those different strands together and the impacts. Um, I would say this is now a personal view. My personal view is that um, the level of population uh, growth that has happened over the last four to five years, which was broadly speaking over a well over a thousand a year in certain circumstances, one year of 1700, yeah. average, seven, average 13 15 over yeah. 10 years, yeah. um, is I don't think that would be politically acceptable to continue as it is. So, on that basis, there will have to be um, a slowing down. Now, the question then will come down to number one is getting the controls in place that enable us to do that first. Uh, number two, and one of those discussions is around, uh, do you actually have a target? Don't forget, notionally, the target was 325, set some time ago, and certainly, the, the, and I think the, the 10 years going back that we were actually looking at today, it, it's been exceeded every year. Um, you then get into the slightly hypothetical discussions, if it was 325, what happens when you actually need a nurse to come in and that educates at 326? Do you say, now that's a stupid example, but there is a point. So, um, so at precise numbers and tar uh, at precise numbers, A, we're not going to start saying now, but B, um, one of the discussions is actually let's get the controls in place and working and start slowing. At the same time, John will be needing some more precise figures around in time for the island plan. And so that will start coming together and in the public domain, first quarter, end of first quarter, beginning of second quarter next year. So at this stage, I'm John Wick's fan, I'm planning to being done on a, on a neutral policy basis, and we are certainly not fixated on when we say we've got to grow the economy, but we are not fixated on growing the population. So we've got to maintain and support the economy, and there are consequences to that. Well, great aspect. I, I know all about the island plan. I've been yeah. to all the workshops, That's and okay. I, I'm still trying to find out from you what the government policy is on, on economic growth. So are you about sustainable, supported growth, or are you about expansion growth? No, it's got to be sustainable. And yeah. sustainable includes both uh, from the financial side, that's about our own internal budget and things like that, and it is most critically it's about what the island can cope with capacity terms and very particularly on population. So absolutely sustainable. Brilliant, great answer. Okay. Uh, John, do you want to add? Yeah, I don't want to add very much, but just to say that the fact find the work so far on the island plan has potentially been um, policy neutral. What we wanted to hear is what people is in people's minds. Yeah. And the early we haven't completed the first phase of consultation yet, but what I'm being told is loud and clear point that you raised that people are saying before we produce a draft island plan we need a clear population yeah. policy and my personal view and this is one I told the council of ministers this is one I stood for before election is that I believe and I still believe fundamentally that the current rate of, um, of migration into the island is not sustainable <coughs> into the future uh, and if it does happen I think that be damaging to Jersey's quality of life. Yep. But having said that, John said there's not been a decision where, as the, but I'm, where that line is to be drawn. That has to happen. I, I've said, in my opinion, and the team are telling me on the island plan, that we need to have that clarity by the time we start drafting the island plan. Because otherwise, if we don't we draft it without, then I personally think it will not succeed. No. Probably yes. it won't happen. So I think, to be fair, 
that you've been listening to our, obviously clearly our Council of Ministers room and must be bugged, I think. Uh, um, because we were having that discussion today, it was a very good discussion. Yeah. And I think members absolutely understand the issue that people are saying. <coughs> and I think, you know, we, you know, it's going to be something which we will be coming back to. Those are the key inputs given today. Yeah. Right, Kevin, thank you. Yeah. So you're, you're very on the ball tonight, actually, because most of this conversation we were actually having today. That uh, the Chief Minister and I were both elected in uh, 2005, and late 2005, I was on Radio Jersey Talkback, and uh, I was with a, a senior senator at the time on Talkback, and I said, Well, I can foresee a time in the future when the population of Jersey will be 95,000 people. And I was told not to be so ridiculous as we'll never achieve that. Well, here we are now, and it's, it's something we're very well aware of. Um, there is an aging population, which includes ourselves, and um, you know, there's a conversation to be had. Where is the line drawn? And we're very well aware of that. Yeah, and that the, so the object of, of, on Chris Taylor's work is, is really to start putting, to understand the issues, and it is hideously complicated, and there are going to be quite hard discussions and decisions going to make. generally. Um, what, uh, and it's not just in the area of planning and development, um, it's right across the piece. And in fact, I'm, we, I've now, uh, I think, um, uh, I can tell Moz that very shortly we will be publishing a report um, from the Planning Officer Society who in the last few months, knowing there are issues, a whole raft of issues connected with, with I think what we kind of might refer to as legacy processes, they're long-standing processes on planning development and they have made a lot of, uh, lot of recommendations and I think the issue of enforcement is something we need to improve upon. I certainly, I got lots of ideas but at the moment I think they will require uh, law changes and I think there is a, a process of law changes on the planning law uh, um, which is I think likely to come forward, uh, an amendment to the planning law of this, this autumn. But I don't want to raise expectations that will be a revolutionary thing. I don't think it, it will. On the question of the questionnaire, there is a review uh, that the team are doing on the success or otherwise of the existing island plan and the existing policies. I think that work is ongoing at the moment, and obviously that will be um, that will be published, um, you know, as soon as uh, we can make progress with that. And of course, uh, throughout the whole process, it's an open process. There'll be one. Of Dialogue and what have you, but there's no question. I think Moz, I, I'm not standing here and saying that our processes are great. I think the reality is, is that they were probably good or adequate when we had 80,000 population. They were starting to struggle when we got 90, and now we're in 106,000 uh, and headed beyond the development pressures on our um, uh, built areas and so on. In fact, our, our whole island are so much stronger that the tools we've got. Uh, I think need to be enhanced, and that's why I certainly put forward in the plan and uh, the plan process for additional funding for some of those pieces of work. And I'm very pleased that they're in there. Shall 
clear of. I could have, I remember having a discussion with my team, obviously I got elected, I wasn't in the States when you know all the previous things happened, I got elected on a mandate, I could have stood up and said this is the way it's going to be. I didn't think that was the right thing to do. I thought what we need to do, we've got a lot of big policy choices and that's why I said to people, look, there's real choices ahead of this island now which are going to long term issues and I think what I wanted to do in that questionnaire was to tease out where people's thinking is, which will then guide us towards the next steps. So look, whilst we're early days yet, there'll be plenty of opportunity, and I'm very pleased that you're on board with us in, in all of your work, and we'll make sure as a, you get consulted and involved. And anybody else who wants to help more to with <laughs> the tough <laughs> task of looking at planning law, it's a tough, tough It's a fair point you make, actually. We've just lost another St. Bernard Hotel last week. Mm -hmm. and it's a fair point. Well, maybe I'll just add. I, I think, look, what I, I certainly remember when past planning committees took a bold decision that we should halt the loss of hotels and have what's called a prime site policy. And unfortunately, it didn't survive the test in the courts, the tourism industry at the time. Um, they made a logical argument that, um, that what we needed is investment in our tourism industries, and if you took away their alternative use value, because housing was the most valuable alternative use in the event of the, of the premises going out of tourism, you would not see the investment. The net result of that in, certain, in years later is that we used to have 30,000 tourism beds and now we've got about 10 or 11. Um, yeah, we keep doing the same thing, we've got the same results. It wasn't anywhere unviable, but they reached a tipping point with the failure. You were asking, is that how you had that before, John? Yeah, go on. My initial question was going to be about population policy and the environment. Don't feel forced to ask another question. <laughs> <laughs> I've got three others, so I'll start with one and we'll just see how it goes. <laughs> um, um, transport, sailing, buses at the moment. I'm, I had the pleasure to go to Turkey for a week in the summer, and I thought we'd be struggling with all the buses, public transport, airport. God, they were fantastic. And you come back here. Um, when I used to work up at the dairy, that meant I had to get a bus into town and then a bus up here. And one was 15 routes, that was every quarter of an hour, that was wonderful. Till I got to town, every two hours I could go. It was quick as to walk. Not I'm ashamed to say, in the winter, I, I just got the car instead. Um, and then I'm taking, my mum won't thank me for this, but she's getting a bit shaky on going around town, town is really big. So she will actually drive in from get the bus to the bus station because there's no offer going around. Just small things like this. Not, neither of us are that proficient at cycling and we're a bit scared now because the roads are so um, chock full of cars. And I'm, I'm a scaredy cat on the bike. Um, you know, the, it's the little things like that that are all adding up all this stupid amount of cars. What, what have you got in mind over the next year mm -hmm. to make you more environmentally friendly? Um, well, basically, it's supply and demand. That we've put on dozens of buses, literally, to come up to the more rural areas, and they've not been used. Um, who was it? Bill Rondo, who mentioned, must have mentioned me, sorry, that um, when the deputy of St. John at the time <coughs> said, uh, we def desperately, desperately need a bus coming up to St. John. So we put the buses on and they were coming up and down empty. Um, Liberty Bus, a very progressive company, um, they put on satellite buses so that a minibus was stationed in all the 
parish, all the parish halls, and they would go out and pick people up and bring them back to the bus stops to get them into town. But that wasn't used either. Uh, we've got double-decker buses on the southern route, number one route, uh, going out to, um, out to the airport. It's, um, it's very, we've got the electric bus, which we're trialling, but uh, I say all the buses actually belong to Liberty Bus. They don't belong to us, they, but they're very progressive company. Uh, since Liberty Bus took over, we're up 46%, and I've just been told we're up another 5% this year. So bus ridership is really, really increasing, but uh, we need to get more buses into the rural areas. We're a victim of topography with the island, a bit of a slope from north to south, and all the buses come down the valley, so the centre point being, obviously, St Helier, which is the hub. But um, you know, you can do all sorts of things if you've got a, um, a bus pass or a daily pass, you can actually transfer around whatever. Want to come in, John? Yes, just in terms of exactly that point has been made a lot, uh, because everything, both jerseys, the St Helier is the central hub of all roads, which is where well, I think General Don arranged it quite a while ago. <laughs> um, and what we've done is we've, we've been in a very limited budget for our bus service and try to get the best value, which is on the southern corridor. But those, to get to the northern parishes, one of the benefits of the, of the fund is it should start funding some of those opportunities in doing that, because I think that service um, to, to Trinity, to St George and stuff needs to be enhanced, and then people will embrace the bus even more. And we've got to put the bus on for the people to come, but we haven't had the budget and they've been very strict and we've had a 23% cut in budget in the last four years. So we've had to be very innovative within the budget constraints. What this fund gives us an opportunity to, to, to take a few more risks exactly that we haven't been able to do in the past. Thanks, John. Can I just add that I think the cost of the bus is really prohibitive. Um, because if you talk about two people coming into town, let alone if you need to go into town and then change bus, they charge you again. Through ticketing has been raised quite a lot, and again, mm. if that's the thing we need to do, then I think that's yeah. a really good point to raise. Because I understand the buses are handling Guernsey, that might be my question. Guernsey yeah. service um, subsidised. It's heavily, our service is subsidised by four million pounds. Guernsey service says it's similar, it's likely it's not at the same level that we provide, um, and they have a difference between local people and visitors in terms of their charging rate, which is quite long to um, do. But it's a, thing to, it, it, it's a different model, and I'm happy to explain the differences. Um, I mean, I will say... It's more popular. Well, it's, it's, not it's, more it's popular. interesting, actually. Okay. Um, and Kevin's comment about the tickets, so since the Lipson Thirty first came in, the ridership has certainly gone up a lot. And, um, and I've, I used to report to Kevin some years ago when, in, in TTS of those days, and that was when the contract would change. But um, the anecdotal remarks I do get uh, from visitors very complimentary remarks about the bus and in terms about the bus system over here. Now, okay, that's a visitor, not a local, but um, it, it's not all bad news. Is what that's what I'm trying to say. Is that How much would it cost the state to fund it and to subsidise it completely? We did have a number. It was in the debate. I don't you, can you remember? Off the top of my head, it was it was very expensive, but there was no incentive for the bus company to expand. Yeah. But um, we, we had a previous bus company who I won't mention. It was um, it was dire. I think that was the hardest job in, I had in my life. I was actually trying to sort that one out. See the director general smiling there. But um, I mean, if if anybody asks me, I've been with the department, if you like, about seven years in total. And if everyone says, "What's the bit you're most proud of?" I'd say Liberty Bus. Yeah. It's head and shoulders above any other company we've ever had. Um, if you have a, an iPad or an iPhone and you have the uh, Track My Bus app, you can actually see all the buses moving around the island in real time. And it is quite Android as well. <laughs> 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 
buses are nice, I say, but we, we have various problems as well. The buses have to be uh, sufficiently small to negotiate the country lanes, <coughs> but they have to be sufficiently big to allow wheelchair access and disabled access. And obviously, they have to be good, clean engines, which they are at the moment. Obviously, uh, we have the electric bus over at the moment, which is an experiment. Um, and it has been routed that down the line there'll be hydrogen buses. But at the moment, everything is very expensive. So we're just working with Liberty Bus to try out different systems. But as I say, to travel around the island, if you have the Avanci car, you can hop on and off as many times as you like. Okay. Um, John, can you recall, we also did have that uh, other debate or discussion, there was a debate actually around free bus provision. Can you remember what the number was? Yeah, it got between 10 and 13 million per annum. Yeah. Um, was that additional? That was total, 24 okay. million. Um, the, the difficulty with that is, is keeping that sustainable in times when we're, we're in a, we've got you know, the island very successful at the moment and, and everything's going well, the, the government plan is, is showing that. But bus, bus services, and UK is a good example of this, if you don't stay sustainable, then they get cut and cut and cut, and the services in the UK are in dire straits. Okay. And it's our only public transport. And we've got to make sure that there is a, an incentive for people to use it, but, it, but being free, I think, means it can, tends to mean that it gets a bit abused. And, and so there's a balance. And I understand that for some families it's very expensive, and I think we should be helping them. Uh, but that's my personal view. Um, and we, we, there's lots of pensioners who get a free bus service. Um, so I think we've got to get that balance right. And I think if I'm using the bus, I want to pay for it because it's it's something that I can afford. And and I think we've just got to keep that balance between services. What do you mean by being abused? I mean, how would you abuse um, the free bus service? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's that's like my genuine question. Yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> well, what happens is, is the capacity and demand is filled by people who, who don't need it to be free. Um, so what you've got to be careful of is you then have to put more and more capacity on there and more and more buses on there to, to actually get the real, the people who really need it on there. And so what happens is, is these services when they do come free, and there's been a lot of other places have done it, and there's lots of experience from across Europe and the world on this. Is what happens is the service becomes unsustainable in the end. So, can I just go through that instance? Because um, I, I don't like the fact that pavement, you know, it's it's Yeah, the discussion happened in the states, so it's yeah. interesting. We, if you know, if it's going to cost you ten million quid a year, um, and basically what you're doing, you're paying wealthy people, um, and that drive a very smart car, shall we say, to who can afford a bus fare, to then um, just uh, it, um, it, we're basically paying paying them not to drive their car. Uh, well, exactly. So if we put the fuel duty on. That will maybe that might start to take a shift, and then that would mean you get you then start making those decisions about what course balance you take. The point is then they pay for the bus fare, and then that comes down to that gives you some economics around the routes, and therefore whether you put more bus on uh, on a particular route because of the capacity and things like that. If it's a, if it's a free for all, bluntly, you'll get the kind of peaks, and um, uh, and actually then it's how you get your yeah, it's how you get your funding sorted out. And then, as John was also pointing out, is if you have a downturn at some point, in reality, if it's a decision between free bus travel and, um, I don't know, uh, sort of sitting with someone who's just lost their job that they've been in for the last 20 years, it's the latter that's going to get the priority. And then your route starts losing sustainability, and ultimately you end up more people going back to their cars because it's not working. Well, 
were saying is that uh, if you if that fuel duty goes then to the environment fund and that includes other sustainable measures, that could include either better uh, bus service, it could, be, it could mean electric buses, or it could mean more cycle paths. You're then uh, cycle routes. You're then making your choice as to where that funding is coming from, as opposed to just fixating on free buses. Also, um, the, uh, hang on. I just wanted to say, I mean, that's a good topic. And I think it is a subject for a broader debate um, because I know that Kevin is doing, you're doing it now, the sustainable transport strategy. I think the states have said they want the sustainable transport strategy back before the end of the year. And I understand your team are doing consultation. I'd be very surprised if we don't see questions about public transport policy in there. And I think we, it's a good discussion. So I counsel that, you know, those, it, it is worthy of it because there's no question that issue of mode of transport and how we achieve it is, is uh, important choices for the uh, I'm also careful aware of time. The gentleman has been down there very, very patiently. <laughs> Can I just finish off with a last question? Do we um, Please, please Mike. Yeah. I've got two comments to make. The first is, um, and I'm one of them, uh, on Saturday evening or Friday evening, the service along the coast road is fantastic. And it's full of pensioners who don't pay a penny for the bus and then go and spend eight or two hundred pounds on a meal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my second comment is uh, about the general momentum of population um, from our industry, the agriculture industry. We're very keen. We've been pushing the Senate of Holland for a productivity package so that mm. that will get less people in the yard to get more product in the yard. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's something that the council ministers should be pursuing. Um, yeah. I'm not going to quote the number, but I think, at least I might try to, I've got a feeling, I'm sure that we have put in something in there, some money specifically towards uh, pr um, productivity. I'm just thinking I can actually find it. Million. Productivity support, yes, 500,000 next year, a million each year thereafter. So the idea is then, we'll see if we get outcomes, we have put some money towards it. And, and my question is, um, I know you've um, reintroduced the speed <coughs> Remember not too long ago, if you watched the national television when Gordon Brown was Prime Minister, he said, everybody must go out and buy diesel vehicles now. Diesel's the way of the future. <laughs> um, well, let's see what we are with that one. We, we are trying to push for electricity as much as we can. Um, electric bike scheme we've just done, and I think we had 300 vouchers to subsidise those bikes, and they've all now been allocated on 330, I think. And um, they've all been allocated now. And people were under the impression that you had to buy a brand new bike for several thousand, you don't. You can buy a quality second-hand one for about 650 pounds, which a lot of people did. So people with a modest income still went out and got these bikes. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, we've taken what, 330 cars off the road because everybody with these bikes now just absolutely loves them. I like to think of Jersey as like Holland with hills. <laughs> Because, uh, <laughs> it's a beautiful countryside, but it's these hills coming up and down. It's in a, you know, we've just come on one tonight, but it's, um, it, it, you know, we, we, just, we love the island. We want to keep it clean and fresh, which is lots of incentives to electrify. Uh, electric cars are possibly a step too far at the moment because um, we don't have any European subsidies like they do in other countries at the moment. So we have to uh, fund everything ourselves. It, but any, uh, any initiatives we're more than happy to look at. We've done, um, not so long ago, we've had, um, we 
deal with a JEC that we put two charging points in all of our multi-storey car parks and uh, we're expand expanding those now to about 10 in each of our car parks. Uh, a lot of private places have them, Hotel Lorazan, I've got them, El Chico's got a charging point outside now. Yeah. So it's, it's, people are coming on board now with electrification. It's, it's very different. What, what I particularly like is I'm a bit of an old dinosaur. You can actually get an old Volkswagen Beetle 1960 and put a Tesla engine in it and uh, it works perfectly well. You can actually retrofit lots of vehicles. And I was talking with the uh, Director General a while ago about some of our fleets, whether they, they're, they're too good to scrap, but obviously we want to electrify, whether they can be retrofitted with electric engines. Um, Jersey Post have done very well. A lot of their small vans are electric. It's coming on board now. People are worried about the price, but the prices are starting to equalize now with electric vehicles and uh, fuel-driven vehicles. But uh, we want to get slightly ahead of the game and encourage more and more people to use electric vehicles. <coughs> right, the point of subsidy on wise van is something we raise in a discussion with Jersey Electricity Company, because if they're doing mileage, they're having the biggest impact environmentally. And so if we're doing the incentivization scheme, Providing electric vehicles as the third car for people who are wealthy is something which I personally have fought against. Um, but, but that's probably my socialist sort of views. But for, for small businesses who are running small vans that are diesel and high mileage and perhaps not maintained quite so well, incentivizing them to have an electric vehicle will have a massive change to the island. So it's what's the biggest impact for the money we have available. And that's something we're looking at. Right, it's five to eight. Um, certainly, there's two questions. There's a gentleman there first, then there. Um, and the council does take two more questions after that, preferably from somebody who has asked a question already. But, uh, and then we'll wrap up. Um, uh, Hollywood Hills, which is kind of a, a an interesting analogy. Hollywood has headwinds, so <coughs> it's always that easy to cycle over there. But um, it's just something I'm, I'm wondering about the size of the roads. Um, and having to get that many cars off the roads to fulfil your obligations. And you start off with a video which was interesting of that small track by the harbour, by the folly. Now I cycle along there mostly every day to and from work. Most of the time, it, I don't want to start cutting up pedestrians, so I get back on the road, and which again is dangerous for me, not just from you know people cars coming trying to overtake me. And, but also from the pollution side of things. Um, and then something Jackie picked up on about how um, generally it's just easier and cheaper to get in your car. So you've got a huge tipping point that you've got to try and get to and a big distance to do that. And I wondered how far you're going to look at revolutionising road space. You can't put a cycle lane on every road because you, you can't expand it. You know, you're going to go into people's gardens or, or whatever, and there are major artery roads in and out of town, for example, that you just can't fit the cycles on if you've still got two-way traffic. So what were you thinking of doing about that? And to what degree are you going to try and remove vehicles off the road to allow improved cycling and improved pedestrianisation and not just take the current one That's a very good question. Uh, basically, uh, most of the roads we have in Jersey, when was the last time we built a new road? Many, many years ago. A lot of the roads were used, not like the UK in a sense, we can't build a bypass. There's the, we simply don't have the room, we're nine by five. A lot of the parish roads, for instance, have got the blocks of granite coming out the wall, the old gate guards, which stops the wagon wheels from scraping along the wall. This is how old these roads are. The uh, infrastructure team and the parishes do a fantastic job of keeping the asphalt up together. But it's, it's a very fine line between encouraging people out of their cars and compelling them to do so. I mean, John and I agree on most things, and we actually argue a bit about this, where how much character, how much stick should be used. And I don't <coughs> want to punish the people of Jersey. I just want to encourage them as much as we can to get out of the car. Um, we, we can't really build any more roads. We have to use what we have. I think I mentioned earlier on that the, the, the bus
process of, of since the new company took over is up uh, 40, 45 percent on the previous one, and we've got another five percent this year. Had we not have had that company doing that good work, then we would have gridlock. If you cast your mind back to a few years ago when we had the rock fall at Mount Bingham, um, people were on the phone complaining saying, oh, they're going to be late from work. So, well, nobody was killed, nobody was injured. It was St. Helier's rock face that collapsed. But our teams helped. I got blamed for it. I got blamed for it. He still has the scars. But uh, you know, we, we got our engineers helped out, and it got it repaired. But the rope access team did a fantastic job getting all that sorted. But people thought that was a minor road. It's not. It's a major artery. But it showed how sensitive our road infrastructure is that if during a rush hour, say there's um, a tail end smash in the tunnel, the whole island will stop. You know, that's, it, it, we just gotta clear it very, very quickly and keep traffic moving. But, um, you know, we, we're doing all sorts. We, the constables and the head of princes wanted a lot of 20 mile an hour li speed limits within town. And I consider it my job to get people home safely, but as quickly as can. People finish work at five, 5.30, they just want to go home. But it's encouraging people out of the car onto public transport if we can, which is on a southern route, which is pretty saturated, but they're doing fantastic. Uh, the infrastructure team are looking to see any particular spaces we could put in bus lanes, but we're constrained by the, the sizes of the roads. Anything to keep traffic moving as quickly and smoothly as we can. We're trying to expand <coughs> the, uh, the cycle network which uh, at the moment we can go from Corpier right the way around to Arc de Par without <coughs> leaving the cycle track. Um, we've got the deputy of Crewville here who gives me a hard time because we're, we're trying to expand with the eastern cycle track as quickly as we can, but uh, there's lots of work to be done there. Plus uh, cycle tracks going into town and uh, the team are looking at purchasing more cycle racks, more undercover cycle racks, <coughs> uh, more uh, spaces for cars. If we take um, two car spaces away, we can put eight bikes there. You know, it's it's that kind of mathematics. But we're, we're working on it, but it is trying to take the people with us. A lot of people, for instance, would be more than happy to cycle their bike now, but give it a few months when it's torrential rain, people want to take their cars. So it, it's this thing we're trying to get around and try to um, manipulate things as much as possible. We, we don't want to put the, the parking charges up too high to punish people with it. But we are trying to encourage people to use more sustainable transport. <coughs> Chandra, short addition. It will be short. Sorry. Um, um, I think Chandra's right. I mean, this is where I think um, we do differ. Uh, I think Chandra's right. Um, we, we, the road pricing equation at some stage will have to be faced. Uh, maybe it may not be faced in this council of ministers, but it will have to be faced. I mean, certainly we have built new roads. We built the underpass 20 years ago. Well, and is that a model for how we should do things? Absolutely not. So therefore, it proves my point about how we need to look at, I think, how the financial equation, and I think that's why a carrot street strategy is required, and we should be prepared to be innovative on that using technology. But anyway, look, uh, we're making progress. I will say one thing. I think Kevin and his team do a darn good job of managing the network to try and keep it going. But I think, personally, in the long run, that I think will require a long-term look. So I think there'll be a point where that won't be possible. Uh, it, was it, was more, it was more than 20 years ago. Anyway, yeah. um, no, right at the back. Yep. <laughs> um, I want to know where we were at with um, the reducing our signal use plastics. Um, the beginning of the year, um, a group of put out um, a report with 20 recommendations in there, and as yet, not seeing the outcome of it. Well, yeah, it's a difficult one. This is really one that cuts over Kevin, Kevin and mine. Um, the, the environment minister's responsibility is for a waste law. Uh, and really, but principally, that law deals with waste, um, waste disposal operations, waste management, if you like. It doesn't deal with waste generation and so on. And I think Freddie and, uh, but Kevin has the operator's job of physically having to manage what are incredible waste arisings in the island. And obviously, yes, 
efforts, uh, your great strides are being made in recycling, but ultimately waste minimization and waste reduction must be the way forward, and in particular plastics. Now, I think myself is that um, as a small island that principally imports material, I think it's going to be very difficult for us to be able to regulate and set, if you like, build barriers and say, right, I'm going to pass laws banning things, banning plastics, banning this, that, if the supply chains elsewhere bring them in. So I think that does, you know, one needs to rely on international cooperation, cooperation with Britain, cooperation with other jurisdictions on bringing in those changes. And we've got the EU single, uh, single use plastics directive, which is, interesting enough, I don't think that doesn't, you know, it's not wide enough. But anyway, we're, le we're leaving the EU, so that raised, and of course, we did have in the UK an environment minister, uh, Michael Gove, who was very strong. And when all the meetings we had on the British Irish Council, it's clear the work that they were going on, they were coming forward with legislation. Scotland has made a lot more progress. So I think what we've got to do is I think we've got to look at our legislative base in Jersey and try and work out ways of doing it. But the big, the great news is the community is really engaged with voluntary commitments to try and remove single-use plastics and waste management. And of course, we've got the issue of the parishes. We're making some progress with the parishes now, aren't we, in terms of the recycling, because it's been crazy that we've had no doorstep collection in a number of areas for Kevin. many years. But I think oh, Kevin and his mm -hmm. team, I, you know, I, I'm a regular customer down at Waste Recycling <laughs> every, every day. But I, I think less waste than that. So I'm sorry, I wish I could make a magic, magic wand because the issue of waste, marine waste and so on, is very, very serious. I think my concern with this is the fact that there's no recommendation when they have a time scale on each of them, and those time scales are passed now. Oh, yes. Well, I accept that. I don't, is, uh, I mean, this is the waste review, I think, was done by the scrutiny panel, wasn't it? Well, yes. Well, I mean, so I think, you know, there is clearly a whole agenda of work to do with waste. Kevin, I'm talking to tell you what he's got in front so I've given you my perspective. Yeah, it's, it's um, fantastic work has been done. Um, we've got the recycling centre down at La Colette. It's, it's doing fantastically well. We've just uh, changed the time so they're open throughout the weekend now, which seems to be uh, fantastic. People seem to be emptying their sheds over the weekend. It's like... Um, like a plastic theme park down there. <laughs> you can take everything down there and you just post it in a box, whatever you want, the glass, your plastics, your just burnables, disposables, your hardcore, whatever you want to take down there, you take down there, fridges, televisions, right across the gamut. One of my absolutely pet hates is we do not charge for any of this. It's completely free of charge, yet we still get flight tickets. And I can't for the life of me work out why. But uh, that's human nature, I'm afraid but a lot of work's being done there. We've got six parishes that do curbside now, and we've got another one starting later this month, which is St. Saviour. So we'll have seven parishes on board now with uh, recycling of plastics, etc. So it's all good news. We're heading in the right direction. Lots of work to be done. The team are working very hard in the background, but we're making progress. Um, I know John putting on a slide on the spot. Do you want to make comments about the screening report? I'll see what we can the desk because it must be a GHG one. Um, <laughs> was, it one, was it the one you did, John? Huh? Was it the one you did? Oh, it is. Well, no, I'm oh, sorry. I, 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 I found it. myself before a scrutiny panel yeah. being so taken to task for all sorts of matters of waste which didn't fall within the regulatory responsibilities. What the, reg the current laws that we have at the moment are about those people that handle waste making sure they do so in a way that doesn't cause contamination, emissions, and obey proper standards. But it doesn't deal with waste arisings. And, and of course we don't... There was a review about single-use yeah. plastic. The single-use plastic review was done, and quite the, the, the challenge we face in terms of the Department of Infrastructure is we deal with, with it at too late at the end of the process. Mm -hmm. We deal with it as sustainably as we can, uh, but it's at that front end, as you pointed out, Manufacturing, the importation, the, the behaviour change, you know, consumers who won't promote that. And there's campaigns in the UK where people take plastics out of the supermarkets and it looks great for our traditional retirement. And um, it, it, the 
very vaguely looked at, and a, again, a review of the sort of way strategy, particularly in this way of the Duke, that was done 10 years ago, and it's definitely worth doing. Um, but what I would say, just to conclude, is um, we may be dealing with some of these factors, the question of better, but we also have 30,000 tons of commercial waste coming through our engine and waste plants, which have a ma massive, which could be recycled, and that has a massive effect on our carbon footprint and our CO2 emissions. I think what we will do is um, I'll add it on to uh, uh, officers to do this um, <laughs> to just check what the position is. Okay, right. Um, we're meant to be. We are a little bit of time. I said one more. I think one more question. Um, and I can't really. Yeah, no. <laughs> you're too, no there's two people there. Um, you both put your hands up at the same time. So if people are patient and they are quick, and ministers answer them quickly. We'll do one, two, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jim Hopkins. Uh, my question is a more general one. Obviously. Uh, I understand the mechanics of the government plan, I understand where it's come from, I understand how the Duke's accused of building the aspirations and the strategic policy that the country reached was before COVID. My question is very simple to the ministers of the region, including the officers of the region, because we're guaranteed that the environment takes fair share of the action in the budget for crime and there's a need to examine uh, what we've got to spend uh, and uh, where we spend it. There are two also Nothing like being put on the spot, is there? Just on the I think the short answer is as far as we can do. And I'm afraid I've learned, hmm. I've learned my lesson now. I'll well, explain why. why. <laughs> I know it is a bit, isn't it? And I'll explain why. Um, so if business as usual relatively carries on, then absolutely. If we have uh, a shock, which I can't foresee, but you know we do have <laughs> people have everything from things kicking off in the Middle East, uh, we've got Brexit and we've got trade wars. Uh, and um, if we had the equivalent of a 2008 financial crisis rather than a slowdown, um, I think what will happen is that everything then will be uh, we'll have to look at. And the point is, we've said this flexibility in the plan, and part of that starts off around stabilisation plan, part of that is not transferring money into it necessarily, just put it to certain areas. Um, so it depends on the number of bullets that are flying around at that point. If it's not too bad, then absolutely, because we've said for the first time for a long time that the environment is one of the key priorities. And so, um, so from that point of view, if it's relatively business as usual, yes. If there is a, a, bigger, fina a bigger financial issue that hits the island that we, as uh, at the moment, aren't anticipating, but bearing in mind that we did this in July and um, things to an extent in the Brexit sphere have changed and that tone keeps changing every time. Uh, if that was to have a real is, uh, hit, then I think you'd have to say that everything, what's the expression? Um, uh, nothing is safe at the end of the day because you would have to readjust. Re readjust <coughs> and that would depend on the severity of any financial impact that we had. We believe we've got flexibility, flexibility in there that means the plans that are in play can stand. But if that flexibility gets stretched too far, then logically, as you say, and that's the old point why we've got flexibility in these next four years, you might have to readdress. But in terms of where we are, and in terms of assuming relatively business as usual, we have a little bit of up and down, uh, and as I said, with the, the, the contingency flexibility we built in, then yes, absolutely. But if, uh, I'm so, uh, you, you see what I mean, that's my caveat, because if there's something we haven't thought about yet, and we are having some quite bleak discussions in certain areas, and then just in case, then that just in case, if you don't know what the consequences are and they actually look severe, then um, it doesn't mean you're going to turn your back on everything, but it might mean that some of the stuff that we really want to do might have to be deferred depending on where we are. But that's, so it's, it's, it's yes, but can't tell you there's an unknown event out there. So I don't want you coming back to me, be back to, coming back to me in a year's time, use guarantee, but we didn't know that such and such event was going to happen. Um, final question. You live in the Sunday place in the British Isles. Yep. Can anything be done to encourage and incentivise developers and homeowners to um, harness the power of the sun to reduce the solar panels? Do anything? Uh, 
uh, as someone who's got solar panels on his roof for, for exactly that, I, I, I would agree. Um, I think that comes yeah, back to the issues around how you use We're currently looking at um, um, improving the building regulations to uh, facilitate that. But I think it does come back to uh, strategic work about the energy marketplace. We're in discussions with um, Jersey Electricity, and I think there are plenty, you know, certainly we're hearing from potential businesses who want to uh, make sure that we um, take up those opportunities to install um, solar PV on people's roofs and buildings, which we really have uh, failed to, to do so. And um, it is strongly argued that there aren't the incentives in the marketplace. We've recently produced a report on that. We've committed ourselves to a strategic review of the energy market. I don't want to go further than that in, in, in public, but there's no question that I don't believe that the arrangements of the energy market can stay as it is if we are to achieve renewable energy uh, a take up and so on. Um, but at the moment, uh, it's, it's the incentivization that I think prevents it. But, it's, but you know, planning wise, we should be doing everything we can, and hopefully we are, to facilitate the uptake of that. Um, I think one of the key questions from that piece of work was obviously as we go on with solar PV and technology, our electricity network will have what call, they call more embedded generators. And obviously that means that two things, the, the network becomes a little bit more complex to manage, and also who pays for the network. I think at the moment, the, the whole situation is driven by a single business model of Jersey Electricity, which is part, almost, I think it's about 60 or percent of the <coughs> government, and I think the policy, that will be part, I believe, of the work we're currently doing, to come back in the policy in the climate change strategy. So a bit complicated, I'm sorry, but in the meantime, the planning rules should help you. And if you get problems, please talk to me and we'll try to see what we can do. Sorry, can I just ask yes. clarification? You said to report on solar PV. Did you say it's just been initially published? No, it's been published on the website. I think Deputy Lavery, Clary Lavery. <laughs> sorry. <coughs> and um, that report is we commissioned experts mm. and, there's, and that's given, I think that's raised the key issues about the way the tariffs work and the incentives and so on. There's no, there's no, there's, well, there's suggested the, the things we need to look at and, and that, that they have got to be done with the current provider. Okay, but probably the other problem with, with PV, is, which I'm, I'm all for, and I'm glad that uh, John supports that, is uh, obviously it's been discussed in the States quite a lot. Um, basically, <coughs> you can put it in to charge up to, for your own needs, but uh, everyone else in, everywhere else in the world, they sell the surplus on to the network. So basically, our network doesn't want it. So it's basically they buy their electricity in predominantly electricity for France, um, supply the, the um, electricity which they pay X for. They don't sell it onto us for Y. So even if they did buy electricity, they buy it at such a low rate it would hardly be worth worrying about. And uh, as has been discussed before, you have to pay, as Karen has been championing, the standby charge. So when you're taking it off the network, you need you pay a standing charge just to be connected to the electricity before you start using it. So the combination of the two, it, it really adds up. And that's something we need to get over. With our own um, energy from waste plants, we put something up to 7% of electricity into the grid. So that powers up about 10,000 homes. So uh, we are getting money back on that. We, we provide that through directly through to the JEC and then distribute it. But we, apart from that, everything comes from France, unless there's a storm brewing and they generate locally. But 99% of the time, it's electricity in France. Okay, so sorry to interrupt again. Okay, if I think Karen wants to come in too. I was, I was just going to say, if you're the majority shareholder, why is this a problem? You've got to bear in mind, Mr. Well, well, we're not the sole shareholder. It is listed on the stock exchange. Yeah. So you've got to make sure that yeah. is one of the it's one of the statutory issues. Yes, yes. um, well, story for another day. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Shall I ask if people are happy? And this, do you want to say anything, Karen? Uh, do you want you to add something? Yeah.
There's a lot of work to be done. Thanks very much. Okay, a um, couple of wrapping up comments and just say thank you for thanks very much. We, we're slightly over time, but hopefully um, we've covered most of the answers. Um, just to finish off from the JSC, and it, it, it's kind of relevant to a lot of things we want to do. Sometimes we forget we're on 9 by 5 with 106,000 people on it, unless we're talking about population. And that means, um, you know, so for the sake of argument, in, in different other industries, because uh, the, the provider of whatever service it is, is so small, sometimes they won't get the prices they want to get equipment in. If it's a specialised industry, there might be only four or five suppliers in the world, say, uh, unless um, they're from somewhat larger jurisdictions. Um, and the, um, sometimes there are issues where, because you don't have that volume of business, you either won't get the price, or sometimes they won't even sell to you, because actually you're just below their radar. So in other words, um, we've got huge advantages in living in Jersey, in terms of, we know it's a fantastic place to live, I hope, uh, and, um, and actually we can act and we can do things because we're small and because we're able, and <coughs> we've got all the levers to do. There are other times when there are constraints about what you might want to do if you were bigger, but actually, when you bear in mind, if you use electricity as the example, actually security of the electricity supply, in other words, if it went out now, would be a bit, you know, wouldn't be terribly happy about it, it's touch wood, quite rare for us to get um, a power cut. And in fact, if you go back to the 70s, I would say, you know, there, there were times that they were more regular. And that has its consequences, but actually that is part of the investment in the infrastructure, the decision to tie the France that was made. That has all sorts of financial consequences, which, for example, you've got to make sure you address if you start changing that model, which is one of the issues you have. Um, so, and I think the other point, it comes back as well, we've always got to remember there is no magic money trick. Um, so people say, oh, borrow, you know, if, we, if, you, if you're going to borrow money uh, and debt, at some point it's got to be paid. <coughs> Jurisdictions or places outside do can go bust. I think Chicago or Denver or something like that. I know it's a city, but I think it was Chicago actually, um, you know, got into real difficulties in the US. Um, and so you've always got to keep an eye. So you've got to make sure what you're doing is financially prudent, um, because otherwise, if you don't have the money, you can't do all the things that we really want to do. And that's just that's the balancing act we always have. And that's why I make the point again about what happens when things go wrong. You've just got to keep in mind that you can't always guarantee what you'd like to do. Um, but we try within the sort of sphere of normality that we're planning on. Um, I hope people have found that I don't know, enjoyable, listening to politicians at, at, on, a, on a Wednesday night, but at least useful. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we're in the, uh, I'm sure a couple of us will be around who want to talk to us afterwards. We do have hopes to go to some ideas, as you all do. Uh, if you've got any feedback, um, I, think there's a, a, I think there is a mechanism to send some feedback through. Yes. Um, well, you can um, provide emails. Is that the easiest way? If anyone would like to provide emails to, um, I'm going to say ghe at gov.je, which is probably not the right one, but I know I can get that. <laughs> and, um, so anyway, uh, to set, or even just to be able to be blunt, email, uh, even email yeah, yeah. these two politicians yeah. actually. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Because obviously the team are working on a whole host of projects. Some people are saying there's too, a lot of, too much consultation going on, but trust me, there is so much work going on. Yeah. So please keep the flow of stuff because I think in many respects we've kind of touched the surface in a number of issues and yeah. some we've done in more depth. But others I think there's work for the future. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you. Kevin, I was talking about flow of stuff. I know many of you here and I know you love to talk about sewers. So don't forget, we have an open day next Saturday, the new sewerage <laughs> plant. It's, uh, it's not yet commissioned. Um, Have you invited Reg? I will invite Reg. We've had, the, what we've got at the moment, it's gone over 70 years, it's been providing sterling service, but it's time to be replaced. It's a fantastic piece of engineering. And talking of electricity, we actually see, uh, I think it's at a thousand pounds a week. No, a thousand pounds a day, I beg your pardon because we have methane generators. Ooh. So that generates electricity that runs the actual plant. Oh, cool. So uh, is that correct, John, thousand pounds a day? Uh, yes. It is, thousand pounds a day saved on electricity using methane generators. So very important. Yeah. 
I Thank you all very much. Yeah. Yeah. With that party <laughs> shot, please. <laughs> <laughs> Get them drawn in, please. Yeah. With that party shot, thank you all. And good luck. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.